You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Alan Don and I, Niels Kastelarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, I hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity enough to check out the back catalog and listen to the past episode that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Nick, where we, among many topics, discussed a couple of academic papers that were critical of time series momentum as a strategy, but also a paper that discussed how volatility can actually be used to define the direction of market moves. Also, I would like to encourage you to listen to the midweek episode where Jem and I had a wide-ranging conversation on the current state of the global macro environment. Uh, Jim has some very strong views on where we are heading, and he does not rule out an explosion in volatility as a consequence. So you probably want to listen to that episode in the not too distant future and of course lastly i would invite you to enjoy the cta mini series where alan and i have had the privilege of speaking to many of the decision makers of most of the largest ctas in the world we dive into the most pressing topics and have gained unprecedented access to these industry leaders who share some exceptional insights to the cta well, so head over and check it all out after you're done listening to me and Alan today. Alan, great to have you back on the podcast. How are you doing? How are things in Dublin? All is good here, Niels. Uh, good to be back. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, um, interesting to be back on this side of the microphone this time, um, but plenty to talk about. Plenty to talk about. I've kind of started asking the people I've spoken to today, uh, sorry, this week, um, is uh, if spring has arrived, because it hasn't really arrived here in Switzerland. What about Dublin? It has a bit. I mean, it's been, um, March was, uh, like the UK, was, I don't know, the wettest in, in decades. Uh, but April has been a, a little bit warmer. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say it's certainly spring has arrived, but not quite uh, feeling very summer-like yet. But I suppose a bit early for that. Okay, good to hear. Anyways, I can't wait to dive into some of the topics we have planned. It's a pretty good lineup, even if we did it ourselves. And um, since we are recording on an unusual date, which is two days earlier than normal, and that is, again, my me to be blamed on that because of traveling, I don't really have a good market wrap at this point in time. Instead, I wanted, as we did last time, touch on some global macro observations instead. So why don't we just start out with hearing uh, kind of your current big picture macro framework uh, as you see today and maybe if there's been any changes since we talked about this, I don't know, five, six weeks ago? Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, uh we had a lot of volatility in March since I was last on, so that kind of kicked off immediately after we were on, um, and and that's probably been the, you know the big focus has been around the, the 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 banking sector and and what is the economic impact of that going to be, from kind of from a big picture picture macro perspective, it seems like we're, we're we're still in a bit of a holding pattern. I would say you know if you're looking at the economic data, economic growth in the US has, has, has slowed a, a bit or continues to be kind of showing that kind of moderate, uh, maybe slightly below trend trajectory, you know, certainly some signs of weakness there in terms of ISM manufacturing new orders and, and the services sector has slowed as well. And signs in the labor market of cooling with jobless claims uh, picking up. Um, and we, I think we've got GDP numbers today, uh, the Atlanta Fed now cast has pointed to to Q1 growth that's just above one percent. So that's kind of consistent with kind of a slowish uh, economic growth picture, but but not dramatic, not a major slowdown yet. And on the inflation side, you know the the the, the numbers of late continue to show inflation being stubborn and coming down. If you look at the piece, core PCE, you know, on a three month or six month annualized basis, you're still looking at core PCE at four and a half to five percent. So. Um, I think all of that, you know, that picture was still consistent with the Fed thinking in terms of doing 50 basis points in March. But then obviously what we had was the, 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 the issues in the banking sector. And, uh, and yeah, and this is a, you know, really very much clouded the picture now because, you know, I think, uh, there is some anecdotal, um, evidence some people are pointing to of, of that impacting credit conditions. But I, I would say it's pretty, tentative at this stage and, and we'll have to wait and see 
what's the economic impact of that going to be? Obviously, there was a lot of stress over a couple of uh, periods there, and, and obviously we had the Credit Suisse as well. But but things, by and large, have stabilised uh, at at you know across the board. Obviously, uh, some banks, First Republic, uh, still under strain. But I would say. Uh, probably too early to say, you know, what's the impact of that. One of the things I've been looking at from a, a market and, and macro perspective is the spread between, uh, in the US, three-month uh, T-bill rates and, and a 10-year rate. So obviously, everybody's been focused on the yield curve and people tend to focus on twos, tens a lot. And obviously, that's been inverted for a while. But it's interesting, if you look at the three-month, 10-year spread, it's... Um, 1.73%, uh, and that's the spread to the constant maturity uh, tenure, looking at the, uh, the, the the Fed data. But that's the highest level, um, so the most inverted since 1981. So it, I, I think it's quite, you know, quite uh, an interesting statistic that, you know, we've, we've had this constant expectation that rates would go up, but they wouldn't be able to stay up and that, we, you know, the market continues to price in lower rates pretty soon. Um, and it's interesting that that expectation is much higher now. Like this, you know, the, the difference between the three month and two year yeah, spread is much greater now than say at the peak of the cycle in 07 or in 2000. Um, so we've got this kind of um, ongoing expectation that something dramatic is going to happen that the cause this reversal in policy, but we haven't quite had it yet. It looks like we may have had it with the banking sector, but it, it hasn't, we haven't seen the real economic impact of that. And I think this comes to the point that, you know, I've been talking about before, you know, obviously monetary policy operates with a lag. Uh, those lags are, are, are variable and, and, and uncertain. Uh, and what you get with, with, with higher rates is a, at some point you're going to get a non-linear response. Obviously, some some sectors of the economy operate in more, you know, respond in more of a linear fashion. Obviously, as rates go up, borrowing costs go up, and that impacts people fairly linearly. But the non-linear impact is if when rates get to some point and it's a tipping point and it you know it tips uh, uh, you know it, the economy into a major issue and that's when you get a big response so i think that's the challenge that the markets are seeing at the moment there's this pervasive sense that okay rates might go up a little bit more but they won't stay here too long um and probably the pain the pain trade for for the market is probably if rates go higher and stay higher for for quite a bit longer that's probably the scenario that people are not uh, anticipating so so i think from from a macro perspective um I would still be of that view that that at some point monetary policy will bite, but we don't know when that will be. I think from a market perspective, it's interesting you're saying, you know, your your conversation with Chem and looking for an expansion of volatility. I was just looking at, you know, a 20-day S&P vol down to its lowest level since um, basically the levels it was at when, when equities peaked out here. So we've had this real compression in volatility in equities. And if you look at the S&P, it's, you know, fluctuating around, 40, 50, 40, 100, you know, traded it there in March, in February, in December, November, last August, September, July, May. It's it traded there back in April 2021. So the market's been just up and down, you know, in a broad range for basically for two years now. Um, so there, there does there is a bit of a sense of this kind of coil, you know, um, you know, uh, compressing and that we may get a breakout on one side at some point. So, so certainly I think that's interesting. And, and, and very mixed, uh, when you, you look within the equity sector, you know, a lot of the sectors in the US, um, technically starting to look less, uh, bullish. I was, I was looking at the Rus Russell 2000 as well. That's only four or 5% off its lows. But equally on the European side, European equities trending very nicely higher. So uh, quite a mixed picture there. So in some, you know, I think markets do seem to be setting up for, for bigger moves at some point in the next while. I think. The higher rates are going to bite at some point, but it's uncertain as to when that will be. At the moment, you'd have to say cash uh, looks attractive at 5%, but also we'd add cash plus strategies because obviously trend following managed futures benefit from, from higher cash rates. And I think that's pretty meaningful at the moment. I was just looking at it. If you think about it, like short term rates in the US at 5%, you're basically picking up 40 basis points every month in terms of return, just, you know, more or less, obviously, probably a little bit less, but, but you know, it's pretty, pretty nice uh, tailwind in terms of uh, returns. So, um, so yeah, I, you know, I, all in all, I think uh, a lot going on, no sign of the, of the major downturn to my mind yet, but, but I do think that, we, that, that we will see a, a reaction to these higher rates at some point, but the timing of it is, is, is a tricky thing.
Yeah, I mean, you make some great points, Alan. And uh, yeah, and but just on the last one about the, the CTA side, I think that's a really interesting one. I think people completely forgot that there's a benefit uh, within the CTA strategy or at least within a fund uh, when it comes to the uh, cash earning some interest after 20 years of it probably didn't earn, uh, not earning anything. So uh, that is a nice pickup uh, for sure. Now, just from uh, a few things, I mean, you, you you mentioned a lot and I've kind of probably forgotten um, some of it, but there's a couple of things that I just wanted to also test uh, with you. I think the conference board came out this week uh, with consumer confidence, which came down uh, in April uh, to the lowest level in 2022. But consumers' assessment of the current conditions actually improved, but their expectations worsened. And it, it, it may go to some of your points about there is perhaps some pessimism, you know, about inflation still, as well as concerns about the banking crisis without a doubt. But maybe people are feeling a little bit optimistic from the fact that, you know, la- the labor market is still pretty strong. Um, and that's the one that everybody seems to be just waiting to give way to to this. Um, and, and by the way, you mentioned the lack of, of Fed policy. And um, as far as I can tell, I came across someone who had done some analysis and correlation studies on 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 lags, and and they came out with about eighteen months uh, as as the kind of usual lag, which is actually still quite a few months away because it's only been a year, even though rates have gone up by quite a while. The the other thing, uh, which one thing I don't think you touched on, but something I picked up this week from Ray Dalio in one of his latest uh, writings, and um, he wrote something like the debt ceiling increase will not go as smoothly as most people expect and will likely become a big election issue that will split the country because both sides will fight for victories and, and will be less willing to compromise. Um, how do you, I mean, do you even in your wildest fantasies think that uh, that, that, that the U.S. debt, I mean, that the U.S. could default? Not because... I think a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, we're always going to get it done in the last minute. But this time around, there are some real political obstacles going on at the moment. So uh, how do you how do you yeah. see that? I mean, I think it is. It's it's I think the general view is that, yeah, it, the likely of the, that the more likely scenario is it does get resolved. But it's it's uh, it's not uh, obviously 100 percent certain that that's the case. And, and I think the concern is that the level of brinkmanship in in Congress is greater now than it has been. And, and we had Barry Eichen Green on, on on the macro series. And that was the one thing that he really pinpointed around, uh, you know, a risks, possible risks to, to, to the US dollar and, and how this might under, undermine confidence. Um, I think the Republicans did pass a piece of legislation. So their plan uh, last night, so they approved in the House, I think that would be um, uh, an approval for an increase in the debt ceiling, but but linked to that, obviously, spending cuts. So that's kind of the opening salvo in in the negotiations. Obviously, the Republicans themselves are not a unified group as well. So so that's 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 a, that's an, another dimension to it. So yeah, I think it is. Um, you know, it, it does seem to be a bigger issue this time round. You know, we've had have these before. 2011, 2013, uh, it's gone into war. We've had shutdowns. Um, so, you know, you would say that's the more likely scenario. But but I do think uh, you will you, you will definitely see headline risk around that, uh, around this over the next few weeks as each side kind of, uh, you know, establishes uh, their bargaining position. Whether we actually get a technical default or not, um, yeah, who knows? But it's it, it's I think markets are on alert for this as as more of, a, of an issue uh, for the next uh, month or so. Yeah, no, absolutely, it'll be interesting. Um, yeah, and a great uh, conversation you had with with Barry. Um, and on that topic, actually, uh, in ten days' time or so, we're going to publish a conversation we recorded this week. Uh, where Kevin spoke with uh, Martin Wolf, the uh, the well known Financial Times uh, editor, I think he is a uh, columnist editor, uh, and um, I mean th- thought provoking for sure, and probably is also going to divide the uh, audience a little bit uh, on some of his thoughts. But I think he also were quite concerned about the political situation as we head into this debt ceiling uh, negotiation. L- last point I just wanted to hear, not something I know uh, a lot uh, about really, but we tend to always look west, right? We always talk about the US, et cetera, et cetera. But 
if we look east, there's another big uh, country called China. Um, and yeah, from an economic point of view, people might think that, okay, maybe they're having uh, the best kind of growth right now and there's going to be some headwinds uh, in the second half on, uh, you know, both from a geopolitical point of view, uh, maybe some tougher sanctions, who knows. But one of the things that, and so I don't know if this is something you, you've you you've noticed or picked up, but, but I'm curious about it, and that is suddenly we're seeing China and to some extent Saudi Arabia showing up in slightly different roles than before. Suddenly they are part of making peace with certain countries that never seem to be able to make peace. They're making deals uh, with other countries. I mean, and it probably ties into um, uh, uh, the bigger discussion about the dollar and the de-dollarization, all of that stuff. But anyways, I'm just curious whether when you look at a global macro kind of framework, whether you factor in changes um, from the East and not just things what's going on in the West. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. Um, and again, it did come up in, in the conversation with, with Barry Eichengreen around the US dollar and, you know, how more and more of these countries are organizing themselves. Um, you know, for example, uh, I think it was between, you know, Saudi agreeing to accept Remimbi in, for, for payment for, for oil, not necessarily pricing, but but in, in, in Remimbi, but certainly effect, uh, accepting payment. You know, so obviously in the last few weeks, we've had a big uh, amount of discussion around de-dollarization and is is that a theme or not and different views on that. And But I, I think certainly there is a, a movement around uh, China to, prom to, there seems to be a movement to promote greater use of Dronimbi amongst, you know, I suppose, friends of China or trading partners, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be in Asia, but 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 nations who are sympathetic to that view of it would be favorable to have um you know an alternative to the dollar so i think that's part of the dimension and and that's coming from the likes of brazil and, and argentina as well as as much as you know uh, china and uh, saudi i think you know obviously china has been promoting their international role for for a number of years with the you know the belt and road initiative so 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 they had kind of retraced a little bit i would say but it's interesting you're you're, you're saying picking up a, a, a more prominent role uh, but i I think the other thing is is like wh where does it stand between the US and 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 China and you know the disengagement you know there, I saw there seems to be a little bit of an olive branch from Janet Yellen recently around that and saying you know it would be detrimental to have a complete disengagement between the US and China but that does seem to be the, the trajectory of travel at the moment so it'd be interesting to see on that dimension you know how serious uh, I think Yellen is has plans to travel or will be traveling to China. So, so you know, I mean, I think that's uh, certainly a key thing to watch. You know, these things who evol evolve slowly and people tend to forget about them because they, yeah, you know, they'll impact more the supply side. But, but obviously, that would be quite a, a significant supply shock for the global economy if we were to see ongoing kind of dis disengagement and and realignment of um, global trade flows. Well, let's hope for the sake of the conversations between the countries that she doesn't make a stop in Taiwan on the way. I think that might <laughs> stir right. up a few, uh, stir up a few things. But actually, on the on the whole point about the relation between U.S. and China, I really would encourage people to go and listen to the episode we did uh, about uh, ten days ago um, with Stephen Roach, the uh, former vice chairman of Morgan Stanley in Asia, and uh, that that was fascinating. And he actually brought up some ideas as to how you could improve the uh, dialogue between the countries, which uh, he believes has really uh, is, is quite critical uh, at this stage. Anyways, let's jump back to something we hopefully know a little bit more about, which is kind of what we talk about every week on this channel, when that is trend following. Uh, now, we're only a couple of days away from the end of April, so naturally we have some idea of how CTAs have fared uh, after a soft Q1, not a disaster, a little bit of soft Q1 caused by the banking debacle in March. Um, and from what I can tell, things look okay uh, as we head into the end of April. Of course, there's still two days left. Anything can, can happen. I suspect that some of the themes driving performance in April so far, um, at least as of yesterday, is things like commodities, or at least some of them. Uh, we have seen a very sweet uptrend in sugar, where the price has gone up by about 16 17% so far this month. In terms of other big moves, I think trend followers have probably been enjoying the downtrend in things like wheat, 
which is off by about 8% in April in terms of price. Of course, that has not made the environmental activists from Greenpeace, who a couple of weeks ago criticized CTAs for making about $2 billion, according to them, from the food crisis of Q1 last year, they have not come out applauding CTAs for, quote-unquote, forcing down the price of the grains at the moment, a down move that has pretty much started at the uh, middle of March last year, where they were pinpointing this you know, food crisis caused by CTAs. And actually, some markets like wheat has dropped more than 50% um, by now. Now, of course, the truth is, they should not write a new article applauding CTAs because we didn't drive the price up in 2022, and we certainly haven't driven, driven the price down in uh, you know this year. That's just not um, typically what happens uh, in terms of how CTAs or trend followers are trading. And I just want to remind people who may have seen the article but may not have heard us talk about it a couple of weeks ago, CTAs were most likely selling in Q1 of 2022 because of vol expansion. So they weren't pushing prices up putting more exposure on, most likely they were reducing uh, positions based off on that. Anyways, uh, another sector that may have helped a little bit in April is the uh, equities. Um, as we've seen, you know, many markets kind of grind higher, uh, as Alan mentioned, based on low volatility. Um, but what does that mean? That means that some investment banks come out and talk about this. So in the latest news, uh, I think this morning I saw um, that trend-following commodity trading advisors snapped up more than $170 billion of global stocks over the last month, according to Goldman Sachs Managing Director Scott Rubner. Now, leaving the con uh, contingent with the highest exposure to equity since the bull market crested in early 2022. He's probably right that CTAs have increased their exposure to equity, so I'm not blaming that. I still think it's weird that the investment banks are so obsessed with what CTAs are doing, um, especially um, those who don't get it right when they talk about it. Anyways, currency and bonds, I think we have been pretty flat um, for many trend followers. Also energies, mainly because I actually think exposure in these sectors are pretty low at the moment. At least that's how I see it. My own trend barometer, um, it closed yesterday at 43, which is still pretty neutral although it's towards the higher end of the range that we've seen in the last few months, where it's been kind of neutral at best and very weak uh, during a large part of this year so far. It has been sitting between 20, which is really some of the lowest reading you'll ever see on the low side, and then briefly touching 50 on the high side, which is not even really positive in terms of expected returns. <laughs> As of yesterday, uh, CTAs were in the beta 50 index, up about 62 basis points, still down about 3% for the year. SGCTA up about 1.18, down 4% for the year. Sukgen Trend down, uh, up 2 for the month, down 5 and, uh, and 0.4 uh, for the year. And the SG so, uh, Short-Term Traders Index down about 76 basis points and down uh, 2 and 3 quarters so far this year. Certain replication funds down about nine and a quarter so far this year. And um, yeah, equities down a little bit, uh, both uh, on a world basis, but also the S&P and bonds are pretty flat so far this month. Anything trend following April thoughts, observations? Yeah, I, I think you've summarized it pretty well. Not It, it looks like on average, you know, a positive month. Um little bit of a little bit of dispersion within it but but not enormous and as you say probably the more interesting moves in commodities within major markets obviously we've had a weak dollar trend that has kind of continued to to grind with the euro kind of grinding up above 110 so i think that's certainly been uh, a source of opportunity and as you say european equities have been kind of up on the month as well a um, couple of you know uh, gold had been trending higher at the early part of the month but 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 peaked out and then as you say the grains and also cattle prices have been going up quite dramatically uh particularly in the early part of the month so certainly opportunities in commodities uh and but but probably more rangy in uh, in bonds and equities uh, this month i would say All right, well, let's jump into the questions and we go to the topics that um, that are actually somewhat linked to, to this question that came in from Lawrence. 
Lawrence Wright, a, a general couple of questions I have. Um, and then um, he asked if we can fit it into the Q&A. Of course, we can do that. Um, he talks about first about, we hear on many of the podcasts, people talk about trend percentage allocation within an overall investment portfolio. I have 20% allocated via usage, including some of the names we know here on the channel, to CTA trend, but I'm approaching retirement drawdown. Question is, do you think the allocation should remain the same or differ when drawing on investments to provide an annual income? Yeah, it's um, it's. I mean, obviously, uh, anything we say is not not advice, and exactly. uh, we, have to, we have to uh, um, say that straight off. And uh, you know, and all of these things depend on um, the individual. Individual, situation. exactly. And yeah. to be honest, uh, you, you know, it, it, a lot of these things, it, it is very individual uh, uh, specific in terms of what else you have, what income sources, all of that stuff. Um, the one thing I, I would say is that, you know, it, it, it kind of depends on the overall strategy uh, for, for the pension. And, you know, within my uh, kind of experience state, I've had more experience with dealing with institutions that have had similar kind of uh, um, situations around this. And and what you tend to find with, with, with large institutions is, is whether they, you know, they often very much have an allocation to CTAs or managed futures as a diversifier to, to their equity portfolio. So if, you know, if they're getting more funded in, in the overall pension and they don't have and they have less need for growth assets, they might have less need for for diversifying assets to kind of hedge that uh, equity risk. So I would say it depends on you know, if the portfolio still has a, has an objective of growing over time, if uh, I'm not sure where the person is from, but say if they're, I, I, I get the impression possibly uh, the UK, UK, yeah. So obviously, you know, the, still got high inflation in the UK, so presumably still wants to try and protect against inflation and uh, grow the the portfolio over over time. So to the extent that you still have that equity allocation within the portfolio, then it would make sense to have diversifying act assets that that, that could profit should that equity allocation suffer a, a meaningful drawdown so so from that perspective you know using the template of what i've seen with with larger institutions that would suggest yes maintaining it as as that uh, in that diversifying capacity yeah i'll keep my comments to the end because there was a follow up question on this and that is Lawrence asked that if you receive a state pension in the uk that would effectively be viewed best as a as a bond with regular income Again, does that affect the percentage to trend in a nominal 60-40 equity bond holding portfolio? But I gather from your answer that probably that doesn't change anything. No, I mean, you can view it as a bond. It's bond-like in terms of, you know, you're getting this income in, in perpetuity, basically. I suppose what you don't have, like if you have bonds and the way people use bonds within a 60-40 portfolio is often that the bond value would go, would go up in periods when equities go down. That was the whole philosophy around that. Obviously, you don't have this because you don't hold a bond in the same way. You're just getting the income uh, in the form of, of a pension. So, yeah, I, I would nearly kind of treat that separately to, to the to the existing portfolio as a source of income and then manage the uh, the retirement pool separate to that. Okay, so my observation, just to to round it off, is that I think if people have been asked this question, say three three years ago, they might have thought, well, you know, as you get older, as you go on pension, maybe you should increase your bond pot part of the portfolio um, because, quote unquote, that is safer and so on and so forth. I think twenty twenty two taught us something, and that is that uh, that may not be the case, and even a sixty forty portfolio can run into some severe uh, turbulence. Um, so my overall take, I'm very much aligned with Alan uh, here. My overall take, and I guess it's always been that, and that is that one, having an allocation to trend following kind of allows you to own equity. And that's just simply from the long-term correlation benefits you get. But now I think we can add that to bonds as well. I think the fact that we long-term have no correlation to bonds um, is very important because I'm not so sure that bonds will behave the way they did in the last 40 years. In, in fact, I'm pretty sure they won't behave uh, that way. And that goes back to this, um, you know, 40-year interest rate cycle that may uh, well have turned a couple of years ago. So I think, Lawrence, from, from where I sit, I would say I think trend following is incredibly important in all portfolios. And actually, we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about some of 
of the ways you know consultants institutions think about um, these strategies in a in a wider portfolio. Before we do that, you did come up with a, an additional question, Lawrence, and that was more about you know how can smaller investors uh, benefit from um, you know having an allocation to. CTAs um, specifically, again, you you you're looking at it this from the European perspective uh, in terms of usage. I'm not sure we in Europe have ETFs, but of course in the US we are still getting a few more ETFs that gives exposure to to these kind of strategies. I think uh, from my perspective, again, this is this is more like a product. It's not so much a strategy and. Generally speaking, we don't get too much into the weeds about certain products. Managers, we see more and more managers uh, have usage funds. We see more and more managers in the U.S. have ETFs or mutual funds. And unfortunately, I think it's just a matter of just following that market and finding out which managers you can get access to through these uh, products. The problem with some of these products are, of course, that they're a little bit more expensive. And so you need to weigh up the expense. You need to weigh up the exposure you get, meaning the leverage uh, you can get because there are restrictions in terms of leverage within, say, usage uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm as frustrated as, as you are probably, Lawrence, in terms of the fact that we can't get every, give everyone access to these strategies because I truly believe that they should be part of uh, every portfolio uh, for sure. Um, but I think I'm going to leave it at that uh, in terms of the specific product uh, discussion and um just follow the space and hopefully it'll change in the future. All right, but staying on this topic of risk and how to assess it, we're going to move on to a question um, about risk mitigation or mitigating risk in a portfolio sense. And you have initially on the trend side, Alan, you've been looking a little bit about the current drawdowns that we've seen in the trend space and just to kind of help us better understand from a historical context, um, what it looked like, so to speak. So I'm not entirely sure where we're going to go with this, but I know you will guide us through this. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think there's there's a couple of things we were going to talk around risk mitigation, but but maybe before then, I mean, it's I I, I think I suppose more in relation to I guess current performance and you know obviously we we, we Q1 was a tough quarter. I mean, not a, not not not. Um, an, an enormous uh, decline, but obviously there was, there was a period in March where where, where, where we've had a slightly more difficult uh, performance, and so it's just interesting um, how managed futures trend following has gone from being in a very good period last year, as as we all know, to being back in in, in a drawdown, and, and we all know drawdowns are part of life in CTAs and managed futures. So it's just interesting to look at the current drawdown in terms of size of drawdown, and how does that compare? versus history and have we seen can we you know infer anything uh from history probably not is the answer because it's you know we've got a small small sample of drawdowns and at any point in time we don't know whether we're going into a more prolonged drawdown or whether this is it in terms of drawdown but i mean just to put it in context the stock chain trend hit a drawdown of about 15 percent uh towards the uh, late march so that's you know obviously sizable enough. It's um, looking at the data. It's the eighth largest drawdown since the index came in, in 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 two thousand. But you know in terms of an index with with with, with volatility of about, of about thirteen percent or so, that's not uh, not enormous. Um, but but it is meaningful. Um, I think it was interesting, you know, to look back and say, well, were there similar periods? And and of course you can you can find periods that are similar. But as I say, we can't say whether it's going to be a, a more prolonged drawdown or not. But what I would say is, like, if you look back at the period between two thousand and two thousand and ten, which was a very good decade for for trend following the Sockton Trend Index, annualized eight point two percent over over. Uh, that decade, there were 10 uh, drawdowns that were 10% plus, and there were six drawdowns that, that were 15% plus. So meaningful drawdowns like this are still n- not unusual, even within a period of very good performance uh, for, for, for trend following. If you were to look at similar periods in the past, if you go back to the, you know, the 
2000 uh, period, there was a, a drawdown of this magnitude back in 2000, and it was kind of similar type of period. Equities were up and down in a broad range. There were a couple of others, you know, November 01 was a big reversal month, uh, and we had a, a, a meaningful drawdown in, in, the, in the index back then. That was a little bit similar to what we saw in March in terms of rates had been trending up and then had a very sharp reversal to trend down. Uh, and we saw something similar back in 2007, July, August 2007. Obviously, August was was the quant crisis, but even July, August, in terms of macro markets, there were reversals and again related to, to, to bond yields. So we've seen this kind of thing before. I mean, you couldn't say just because we've seen similar ones before, that's it, that we can be confident that we've seen the worst of it. But certainly it shouldn't be, you know, although I'm sure it can be frustrating for investors who maybe came in towards the end of last year, it started this year, it, you know, it's obviously, uh, it can be frustrating. But in terms of the size of the drawdown, I would say, you know, very much comparable with, with what we've seen uh, historically uh, so far. The other thing that was noteworthy when you look at the index is how low volatility had got for for, for, for trend following managers towards uh, the start of March and then the huge expansion of vol that we we saw recently and and that's very evident if you look at kind of 20 day vol but but less so if you if you kind of look at something uh, more smoothed like 260 day vol so yeah i mean you you can you can build narratives around these drawdown uh, statistics but as i say we we don't know ex- uh, um, you know what the future holds except to say what we've seen today is very normal and very typical even in a period of very good performance for for trend very true. One thing we can also say for a fact, and that is, so far, historically, um, CTAs have come out of every single drawdown they've been in. Uh, of course, we don't know about this one, but uh, at least that one we can say from the data. All right, good stuff. Now, I mentioned before that you know, uh, these strategies, and Lawrence also, uh, in his question, alluded to the fact that they are Really good to have, you know, in a portfolio to mitigate risk. Of course, they can play a very meaningful uh, role in this, provided that you allocate a reasonable part of your portfolio to it. And you dug out a paper from uh, Mikita, I think they're called, that I would love for you to um, to talk about. I think that's probably going to be our main feature today. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, it's an interesting paper and it's... Um it's all about the, what what are called risk mitigation strategies, and uh, you know, for for people who are maybe not um, you know plugged into the public pension space in the US, you know, this is 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 a terminology that has become quite widespread. You've got crisis risk offset or risk mitigation strategies, and I think I think Calsters used the term risk mitigation strategies, and um, you know, it is interesting. You know, I was at a conference in London last week, a volatility educational event, basically, from a lot of volatility traders. And, you know, there, there was certainly a very strong sense of this philosophy coming through that that a sensible way of managing portfolios is to have growth assets, and then manage the, the downside risk of those growth assets with either volatility uh, strategies or trend following because they will benefit from from different types of equity drawdowns. And, you know, there's a near kind of, you know, it, within that community, a, 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 a nearly a universal acceptance of that, that, that that's a sensible approach. But then obviously you go outside of that to more mainstream investors and, and, I, and I would say that's not universally shared. So an interesting disconnect. But, you know, the, the theme at, at the conference is very much aligned with this idea of using... Uh, risk mitigation strategies. And, and the Mercator paper is quite good on, on, a, on a number of fronts. Firstly, they make uh, straight out the bat, um, they, they highlight a problem with many you know, institutional portfolios in that a portfolio might ostensibly look like it's highly diversified, uh, but actually it might have a lot of the one type of risk in it. So they have a chart in there showing you know, a portfolio consisting of private equity, global equity, US international, real estate, high yield, hedge funds, commodities, tips, investment grade bonds. But by their estimate that that portfolio might have, you know, basically 93% exposure to economic growth risk and and 7% exposure to other things. So, you know, Bridgewater have done some research on this before highlighting the same thing that a lot of institutional portfolios basically are attuned or, or, or biased towards 
um, stronger economic growth and, and, and lower stable inflation and do well when, when that's the macro scenario, but do badly when you get the opposite of that. And, and I think that makes sense because, um, this has certainly been a theme that we've picked up on in the allocator series with a lot of allocators that you it, it might look like a portfolio is highly diversified and you can have lots of different buckets to, to give you comfort that you have lots of different things but ultimately they they might be just different shades of the same type of risk and and specifically a lot of strategies will benefit when economic conditions are favorable or liquidity is ample or rates are generally falling and inflation is stable but what happens when 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 that's not the case so i think that's the that that's the first point and and they they they, they present that that well so the solution to that is obviously to have more risk mitigation uh, so growth uh, mitigation or, or or growth management strategies and th- their way of thinking about this is in terms of I suppose, splitting those strategies for, up between what you call first responders, second responders and, and diversifiers. And I guess the idea of this is to have different strategies that can benefit from different types of e- economic downturns and equity uh, downturns. So first responders are duration, uh, long vol and tail risk strategies. And I guess specifically, um, well, before I go into that, and then second responders are, are, te- are is, is largely trend following. And then diversifiers are tended are, are a range of, of uncorrelated alternative risk premium or, or hedge fund strategies. And the reason for this, I guess, is that if you have a, you know, you're managing your portfolio for different types of um, uh, equity drawdowns. So if you have a more of a March 2020 type equity uh, downturn, which is very short, sharp. Um, what kind of strategies will do well? Fast trend, maybe, but if you've got slow trend, that could struggle. Obviously, in that kind of shock environment, a disinflationary shock duration will tend to do well. It, well, at least it, it initially it did do well. Obviously, we did have such a shock that that we had some challenges in the treasury market in, in that scenario. But you can see the logic for this, for, for kind of a growth, a, a very short sharp growth shock or disinflationary or capital market shock generally there's a flight to quality and that's why duration might do well and that's why volatility strategies particularly if going into the period volatility was low you could understand why why volatility strategies and the differentiate between long vol and tail risk long vol my understanding tends to be more relative value trading has a convex uh, return profile but not as pronounced as the tail risk is obviously designed to generate strong returns in particularly extreme events so two two types of approaches there so that's your first responder so so they're there to help you help the portfolio for that first initial shock uh, and that could be just that it's 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 it could be a feb uh, 2018 type scenario or a march 2020 type scenario then obviously from the perspective of a more prolonged equity downturn uh, such as a 2008 or 2022 that's where you get the you know trend following has that role in the portfolio uh, obviously if volatility gets elevated within that downturn it could be more challenging for for for, for volatility strategies so having that blend between first responders as they call them and second responders uh, you know i think i think i think it makes sense and and i think that's the direction of travel for 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 a lot of uh, allocators Interestingly, they also include like diversifiers as as this kind of third bucket, and the diversifiers can be things like global macro, alternative risk premia. They mention insurance link strategies, arbitrage strategies, equity market neutral, multi strategy, and I guess with all of these, they'll tend to be uncorrelated with equities, but not necessarily have that convex return profile that you expect from volatility strategies or from uh, trend following. And it, it, these are partially to deliver on correlated returns, but it also uh, there's a strong behavioral element to including this in the, in the risk mitigation uh, bucket as well, from the perspective of trying to deliver absolute return and s- effectively smooth out the, the return from your risk mitigation bucket. Because, you know, if, if, if the risk mitigation strategies bucket you know, has that positive skew, which you would expect, it's going to have periods of where it's not delivering performance. And that can be challenging, obviously, in terms of investors' ability to hold these types of strategies. So at the conference I was at, it was referenced, I think that, that CalPERS has exited these types of strategies in 2019, you know, when exactly the time when, when, you, when you didn't want to be doing that. So 
you know, I think we have to be cognizant of the behavioural challenge and that, you know, there are investment committees that people have these biases. So um, I, I do I do think it is reasonable to, 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 to factor that in um, as you are building out the portfolio. So, I mean, that's that's the um, the kind of the broad framework of, of, of risk mitigation. I would say the general philosophy around this is moving away from equity bond portfolios to equity risk mitigation strategies. I think generally what you see is these tend to be maybe a 10% allocation, but, you know, maybe will be growing over time as, as this kind of uh, gathers um, more momentum, I, I think, in the community. And then the precise, uh, I suppose, the last part of the Maqueta paper is just saying the precise mix of those strategies and the balance between growth and risk mitigation will will vary depending on, on the portfolio. So, I think I think it was a good paper. I mean, I think there were other things you could go into as well. Obviously, you know, within trend following, there's lots of different types of trend, and we've picked up in this. You know, you have more defensive trend, like we talked to the guys at Pimco about, and then you've got considerations around capping equity beta. So there are additional layers you can think about with respect to individual strategies. But at a high level, I think the framework is 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 helpful, and and I think we will hear more about this. Yeah, no, a great, great summary, uh, and thank you for doing that. Um, it's interesting. So you mentioned calsters, and actually calsters were relatively early. Well, they were very early in terms of using the term risk mitigation and actually setting aside a sleeve of their portfolio. I think it was 12% uh, in the early days that they wanted to get to. Um, and I interviewed the CIO of Calster's Carrie Lowe uh, many years ago on, 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 uh, on the podcast. And back then she was explaining that the portfolio at the time was about 40% trend following, 35% long bonds, and then some other hedge fund strategies and stuff like that. And now, of course, it kind of would be interesting to uh, to hear whether that uh, has changed, uh, meaning since interest rates went so low, could you still justify having such a large allocation into uh, into treasuries um, as a risk mitigator? Of course, last year we found out that they're certainly not always a risk mitigator. That would be one thing. The other thing that I was thinking of when you were talking about this, Alan, is that from my understanding, and this is just one pension fund now, albeit it's a big one, but because they are so big, their allocation into the managers that they have chosen, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven trend followers, they're becoming a very large part of each of these managers' uh, overall AUM. Again, this is just one pension fund. So um, you may know this better than I do. Um, I certainly hope you do. And that is, you know, how many other US pensions fund funds would you say Ad adopt this. Do you know of any European uh, pension funds that have gone down this road? And frankly, if 10 big pension funds say, yeah, this is what we're going to do, is that kind of, you know, they're going to fill up the whole trend following space with just their allocation, so to speak? Or or how do you see that uh, dynamic? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question. Um, I have seen, I saw uh, just uh, somebody uh, talking about recently how more and more U.S. pensions have been increasing their leverage a little bit and using that to increase, to allocate to diversifying strategies, which is kind of on the same theme. It's not exactly the same. So so within the U.S., I, I would say, certainly in the public pension space, I, I, I guess there's like more than 10. I, I, I don't have the numbers, but but certainly it's it's not a small number that would have something in with this label on it. I, I think in Europe, I, I haven't come across the, the label as such. Um, obviously, I think some some institutional investors obviously allocate to, to these types of strategies and, and think about the same framework, but but I don't I haven't heard the same label being applied. You know, I think with the very large like institutional investors, the sovereign wealth funds, a lot of them don't tend to. Um, you'd probably know more like the Lord, Nord, likes of the Norges Bank Investment Management. I don't tend to have external much external allocations to hedge funds, whether they do this stuff internally or not. I, I don't know. Obviously, you know it, that is part of the, the 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 unknown that we've talked about before. How many kind of large institutions are running these types of strategies in-house you know obviously some of the canadian pensions have, have done that historically so 
it's a good question. Um, I, 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 th- I think, I think it's one that where the uh, it's it'll be it, it, you know it, the, the, there remains the behavioural challenge of convincing people of the merits of these strategies, and that while you know as I said it was it was kind of uh, the consensus view at this niche conference I was at, uh, I, it's not the consensus view more broadly in the market. So. I think we're we're a good bit away from that capacity consider, uh, consideration yet, but and and there, we may never get there because the the reality is holding uh, risk mitigation strategies is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Yeah, no, I I think you're right there on that. But anyways, there's always hope. Now, the only thing I thought uh, of the paper when I read it is I always find it curious when they talk about these diversifying strategies, right? Okay, global macro, I'll agree, that's diversifying. But then they mention all these risk premium, multi-strategy, equity market neutral, stuff like that. And I'm thinking a lot of that stuff, you're kind of investing in the same underlying you're trying to diversify away from. You're just calling it something else. And we know the correlations are pretty high anyways with the underlying um, markets you're trying to get away from. So I'm always a little bit curious about why it's called diversifiers because I, I wonder how much diversification you get from it. But... Leave that as it may. The paper also talks a little bit about correlation hedges, structural hedges, and explicit hedges, and I thought that's also very useful for people to be uh, aware of. Now, now you've talked about how they think about these things, and I kind of wanted to ask you, given the fact that you've interviewed quite a few allocators in the allocator series, um, how would you think about doing it if if you were suddenly given uh, the magic wand by a pension fund saying, well, Alan, I, we need to have an alternative investment portfolio here. And, you know, what, what would your argument be in terms of how it should be fitting inside the overall portfolio and how would you go about um, actually structuring such a portfolio? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's something that I talk to investors about all the time. And, and, and I mean, ultimately, it's... Um, you know, I, I, like, and the same. We, we, we kind of get the same answer as well when, when, when we did the um, uh, CTA series. That that a lot of this stuff comes down to objectives, but but largely speaking, you know, by and large, the objective with it, with it, with an alts portfolio, or even if you're specifically a liquid alts portfolio, generally the the objective is diversification. Uh, to equity risk plus absolute return. I mean, that's what most most uh, investors are looking for. Big, you know, they, obviously you can get protection against equity downturn uh, by buying puts, obviously, but that comes with with a high cost. So it's kind of it's what's the most effective uh, low cost uh, diversification and executing that in in a, in a liquid alts uh, portfolio. And 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 I say liquid alts because I think liquid alts using that expression you know the, the types of strategies that we're involved in do lend themselves to, to this much more to the than the private you know a lot of a, a lot of investments in the private are labeled alternative and they might be alternative in terms of their construction but the risk you get is n- not necessarily very alternative to the risk you get from from public equity markets so 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 focus on diverse truly diversifying strategies so i i think a few things to to think about one you know, if in the first instance, focusing on those strategies that are um, that do deliver that, that that low correlation and the potential of that convex return profile. So specifically, trend following is obviously the one that probably has uh, that, that 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 the greatest historical reliability in that respect. But uh, as we know, won't work in every single environment, and particularly short uh, uh, sharp uh, inflection points in equity bull markets. So there is that case for possibly short-term strategies uh, fill that potential role alongside other types of long volatility strategies, um, and and then outside of that, it, I think it is balancing that behavioural element with the pure portfolio element in the sense that, you know, I think if you just wanted a pure diversifier, you know, maybe a trend-only portfolio would be sufficient, but can an can an investor can a whether it's a wealth management group or a uh, a, a public pension plan can they stay invested with that in in in, in a prolonged drawdown? So that that's that's where I think there is a, a merit in including other strategies in in the same vein as uh, Maketa to things like global macro, uh, quant macro. You, you know, specialists in commodity trading. It, it could be relative value trading, foreign exchange trading. All of those things will tend to have an uncorrelated return profile, but won't necessarily have that 
convexity and that expectation of very strong returns in in periods of stress, but but should have positive return expectations over time. I think it's interesting to think about what what not to include, what to ex- exclude. Um, so certainly things that are short vol, either explicitly short vol or short vol in kind of characteristic. Um, I think things that have an inherent equity beta, um, you know, th- particularly things like credit strategies. Um, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, what you often see in markets is some assets or strategies may have a low correlation to equities in an equity bull market, but in times of stress, they're benefiting from the same conditions. So that could be either economic growth or liquidity. And 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 what happens in an economic uh, an equity downturn is they become more positively correlated. So the phenomenon of correlations going to one and their volatility picks up. So you can see that their equity beta actually increases um, uh, in, in an equity downturn, which is, which is the opposite that you want. So you saw that type of thing with Say, for example, um, credit in, in the US, uh, like the LQG, LQD or HYG uh, kind of ETFs during uh, Mar- March 2020 had, you know, extreme moves in the downside. So, so, so credit type strategies, short fall in strategies with, with inherent um, equity um, uh, bias, they would all be things to, to, to exclude. Lo- very low vol strategies as well tend not to work well because you're going to be taking up some of your, your your risk budget with something that, or, or your capital budget with something that's not going to give you a lot of bang bang for your buck. And then I suppose there's a few you know few principles that 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 that, that I would uh, believe in uh, from my background. Obviously, multi manager uh, philosophy. You know, even within strategies. Um, so even within trend. Obviously, we 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 know that there's many flavors and ways of approaching trend. Not necessarily one one right way. So I think you can get benefits from. From, from multi-manager. I think you have to look at, uh, from a portfolio construction perspective, volatility adjusting is very important. You know, you have to, it's, you know, for people in our industry, that's that's kind of, you know, it, it goes without saying, but once you move outside of the CTA experience, I would say it's talking to people in wealth management firms that, that sometimes gets overlooked, that, that you have to take account for all of that volatility and that sounds like an easy thing but but it can be a little bit trickier when you're dealing with managers with a more erratic volatility profile so a manager who generally is a stable vol but then can go through periodic uh, bouts of very high vol so do you penalize them from from an allocation perspective because of that volatility profile so i think that's the second thing from kind of from a portfolio uh, construction perspective then i think the third thing is is you also then have to look through at the individual manager and strategy level to 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 get a sense of what the mix of strategies you're getting within that manager so you know a lot of the managers we we see in the cta space would be, you know, diversified trend in the sense that there might be 70% trend plus 20 or 30% in either relative value strategies or quant macro. So in opt in, you know, constructing a portfolio, you have to account for that and weight the, the underlying components, uh, you know, according to the, the volatility of the, of the program. And then beyond that, it's a, ma- a matter of, you know, looking at the stability of the correlations, thinking about what level of volatility does this um, portfolio want to run at. And then that will dictate how, how leveraged or not the portfolio will be. Uh, and then obviously looking at things from, from, from a fee perspective as well. Again, you have to adjust for, for, for the volatility to get a sense for how much bang for your bucket you're getting when you're allocating to, to the, to the manager. So, so that, that would be the kind of the, the approach. So kind of starting off with the overall objective of the portfolio, figuring out what, what, what kinds of strategies can help meet the uh, overall objectives, thinking about what strategies to, to exclude and then getting more into the, um, the portfolio construction and manager selection process and uh, building that portfolio to, 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 to the specific mandate. Yeah, super interesting, very comprehensive, Alan, as always. So uh, really appreciate that. There's one thing I think we're probably going to wrap up. Uh, maybe you maybe you have a couple of points you want to make uh, on one of the uh, papers. I think Aspect came out with a paper, um, but I will leave that up to you. But just one thought, as you were talking about these things and portfolio building, Maybe this is just me seeing something that is not there, but maybe in our wonderful community of people listening to the podcast, there are people who have studied this. Uh, if you have, feel free to uh, to uh, let me know, email me. I, I don't know if it's just me observing this, but I, I'm kind of thinking that some of the shorter-term strategies that are 
meant to do this risk mitigation, as you say, the first responders, I I haven't seen, I've seen less response from them, so to speak, um, um, and maybe a slightly higher correlation to equities than I've noticed before. And I was kind of wondering whether that's because some of these managers that we know well and part of the series we've just done, actually, some of them at least, uh, whether there's, there's, it's changed by size or that they're less nimble to to take advantage of some of these things. But um, that's just my kind of gut feel. Uh, I could be wrong. Maybe it's just uh, too small a sample size anyways. But if anyone has noticed the same, done a study of this, uh, feel free to uh, to share that. Um, Alan, um, as we wrap up, did you want to um, uh, say a few words about um, the paper from Aspect? Um, I guess I'll just give it a, a, a shout out. I, the Aspect uh, produced a, a paper just called uh, "Trend Adaptive Agile Resilient," and it's it's a it's a short paper, but 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 um, worth a quick look. Um, interestingly, within it, they, they they show they go back to the 1970s, showing how uh, their Representative, a representative trend system would have done, and just interesting how you had a bunch of very positive years in in the nineteen seventies. But 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 the the main thrust of the paper is is around what is the outlook for trend following and, and answering that question, which is a really good good question that that you know I'm sure you get asked a lot, Niels, and I certainly get asked, um, you know, and have got asked a lot over many years. And it's always a tricky one to know how to answer. You can either say, you can, you know, allude to the macro environment and say, well, we're seeing more volatility and higher inflation and more dispersion across rates, etc. So that should be good. But you would have said, you know, I mean, you would have said that last October and we're still in a 15% rollout for trend following. So that's just the reality of things. But but so they take a slightly different approach to trying to answer that question um, based on, on the kind of adaptability of, of, of the trend strategy. And really, you know, it was, uh, I won't go into it, it all, but, but it is worth reading. It really comes down to, I suppose, trying to get investors to, to, to uh, you know, think more probabilistically whether that is reasonable or not. Uh, I'm not sure, but I mean, what they show in their paper is that, that you know, the trend should be able to adopt to multiple environments and, you know, that, that, that the return expectation would be positive over time. Um, they actually simulate, you know, they, they, they feed their trend system lots of different um, scenarios using Monte Carlo, Carlo simulation based on actual price data that we've seen. And what they found was, you know, that in 80, I think it was 85% of the one year periods, they were positive. Um, which you know, which seems high. Uh, obviously, these are gross returns, but yeah, I think I think there was certainly plenty of food for thought, thought um, in terms of trying to answer that question and, and get investors to think differently, as opposed to just saying, "Oh, the outlook is good or bad." It's that well, the outlook is 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 always you know positive, but but with a risk of of of, of an unforeseen drawdown. Yeah, or so I'm not timing, sure if I'm convincing yeah. you with that, Niels, but, but anyway, maybe read the paper to, to draw your own conclusions. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I'm easy to convince about these things. Um, but what I will say is that it's, it's a question that I find kind of interesting because, you know, sometimes I come across people um, and we, we, don't, we don't show our full 48-year track record. We, we show 38 years of track because there was a change of the uh, program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but still, even with 38 years, and even if, you know, as you say, the 70s were pretty good and they were for us as well. So when you look at the 48-year period, you will think, okay, that probably includes you know, as much change you can imagine, um, it will be different change in the future, but this was pretty radical change from going to the 70s with very little technology to a world like we live in today. I mean, that's pretty extreme. And yet people will still say, do you think trend following works? And I'm kind of, that's that's what I find interesting about it. And 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 I do think that the best way to answer the question that they raise about the outlook is actually looking at the long-term evidence we have. I think that answers the question because our our whole premise is that we don't know what the future holds, and we didn't know that. Um, certainly when we started in 1974, we had no idea. We still have no idea what the future holds. Yet, as, as Aspect puts it, and as you just talked about, 
it is an adaptable strategy. And I think that's one of the critical advantages that the strategy has. As Katie Kaminsky talked to us about, it has that opportunistic style. It's not captured in one asset class. It's not only long only or et cetera. It has so many things going for it. So as you can tell, Alan, when you trigger me like this, I go straight into finding all the uh, positive adjectives I can think of, um, which probably people know already. Anyways, uh, this was fun, Alan. Thank you so much for all the preparation, all the hard work that you uh, put into today's conversation. If you enjoy these conversations and all the, the work that goes into preparing them for you every week, uh, perhaps we can ask you a favor, and that is to go to um, your preferred podcast platform, leave a rating and review, because it does matter. It does help us. If you don't know how to do it, you can go to toptradersonplug.com forward slash review, and there you have all of the instructions. If you have questions for us, uh, you should send them to info at toptradersonplug.com because next week I will be joined by Mark. He's back. Uh, so I'm sure there's going to be uh, some interesting topics that he's going to bring. But as always, we find it interesting and uh, I think it's uh, useful for the whole community to hear what's on your mind. So do send in your questions and we'll do our best to address them. From Alan and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor podcast series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.